it's delightful to see so many people here. We've had 4,000 registrations this afternoon alone, which is very, very quick for our meeting. We expect to have uh, over 7,000 here uh, during the week. Um, the topic of this evening's plenary is geography in the changing worlds of higher education. The recent recession has focused considerable attention on the future of higher education, particularly these impacts of recent budget cuts. Yet I think the threat of long-term fiscal austerity is only one of the many challenges we face in higher education probably over the next decade or two. Um, and this is a situation both here in the U.S. and internationally as well. I remember when I was thinking about organizing this session last year and I mentioned it to my friend John Adams, one of our former uh, presidents as well. And, and John made an observation. He said, you know, if our colleagues think the worst is over when this recession lifts, they're in for a big surprise. Because I think among the challenges that are just around the corner are challenges that are much greater than the recent recession. There's the impacts of globalization and the changing dynamics of the knowledge economy the rapid evolution and, and, and deployment of learning technologies, uh, e-learning, now the new buzzword, especially in the distance education area, the rise of for-profit colleges, which are in the news so much these days, and all of the, um, the innovative programs that are going on there, the changing public support for higher education, as you know from the situation this winter in my home state of Wisconsin, the, the changing academic labor market, contingent labor, increasing use of temporary instructors and so forth is really changing the landscape of higher education. And also just generally neoliberal reforms, general trends in the political economy of higher education are having tremendous impacts on us. But additionally, and you know, those of you who are in higher education, there's tremendous pressure these days to increase accountability. So for example, this encouraging of greater diversity among students and faculty, a better preparation for both academic and non-academic careers, um, this, this need to focus more and more on multidisciplinary multi and interdisciplinary efforts, and also issues like um, completion rates and time to degree are becoming increasingly part of our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. I think, though, the key question for geographers is how we can respond strategically to these challenges. That is, where, where, where should we be going? Where should we be positioning ourselves? I don't want to exaggerate or either, either minimize the uh, consequences of some of these changes, but I would like to focus some attention this evening on three different issues. That is, key opportunities for geographers to contribute and gain from some of these changes that are underway, both within the U.S. and uh, internationally, but also to focus on some of the crucial challenges that we face that may weaken or threaten a geography's role in higher education. And the third issue, finally, is strategies that may help individuals, departments, the discipline as a whole focus and move um, effectively toward responses to both these challenges and opportunities. Now, we can't possibly cover all of these issues tonight. Maybe if we had the length of the annual meeting, we could. But what I've tried to do is invite three distinguished panelists to focus or to highlight a few of these issues to get the discussion going. We're fortunate, actually, Rod Erickson will be here later in the week and is also giving a plenary uh, session for the Journal of Geography and Higher Education on some of these issues as well from his perspective at Penn State. But the speakers that I was able to invite come from both inside and outside geography and I think offer perspectives that are based on a really wealth of experience and, and research as well. They include Dwayne Nellis, to my right, president of the University of Idaho, and a past president of the Association of American Geographers, as well as a past president of the National Council for Geographic Education. Next to Duane is Marisi Narad, the founding director of the National Center for Innovation and Research in Graduate Education, CERG, here at the University of Washington. And our third panelist, delightful Orlando Taylor, who is currently the president of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology's Washington, D.C. campus, but previously was dean of the graduate school and vice provost of research at Howard University. Now, I've asked each of the panelists to spend about 15 or 20 minutes highlighting these issues from their perspective. And I'll, I'll try and keep them on target <laughs> as best as I can. But I'm sure you're going to have questions as we go along. I think it's very difficult to, to raise questions in a setting like this with such a large room, 
So what I would ask, if you have questions at any time during the session tonight, to write them down. In fact, we have some index cards that will be available to you. You can write down questions. And then what I'd like you to do is pass them in. If you look around the room, we maybe can have a show of hands. We have several program assistants here in the, in the audience. Back here, over here, back here. So if you have a question, just, just hold up a slip of paper, hold up your hand. And what they'll do is they'll bring the questions down front to past president Jan Monk, who's here, and my colleague Michael Solom from the AAG, two of my colleagues on many of the research projects that we're addressing. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll sort the cards, bring them up, and I hope then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, toward That'll be a way, and so um, please feel free to write down questions on that. Um, so just put up, put up your hand, and then we'll get the questions to Jan and Michael. Okay. So let me begin, then, with introducing our first speaker. Dwayne Nellis, as I mentioned, is president of the University of Idaho and a past president of our organization here. Prior to his appointment at Idaho, in 2009, Duane served as provost of Kansas State University from 2004 to 2009. He was also dean of the Everly College of Arts and Sciences at West Virginia University from 1997 until 2004. Before moving to West Virginia, Dr. Nellis spent 17 years at Kansas State University as a professor of geography, head of department, and senior associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. President Nellis is recognized and has been honored extensively both nationally and internationally for his research using satellite data and geographic information systems to analyze various dimensions of rural land use and water use as well. So let me turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, and it is a real pleasure to be with all of you tonight, and especially be with, uh, with uh, geographers from not only around the United States, but all over the world. We, this is so special to see the growth in the Association of American Geographers and, and the vibrancy of geography today. And uh, it's so, so important as well when we see what's happening uh, in higher education uh, across the United States. I believe the title of one of the National Academy of Sciences reports from last year captures the sense of urgency in higher education today. The title of that report is Rising Above the Gathering Storm Revisited, Rapidly Approaching Category 5. In my opinion, the storm has arrived, and it's how we respond to this challenge that in many ways will shape the future of the United States' higher education system, as well as the discipline of geography. The U.S. recession major budget cuts, and overall global economic turmoil have brought tremendous stress to most of academia, as Ken mentioned. Here in our host state of Washington, Washington State University and the University of Washington could be down approximately 50 percent in their state appropriated budget in just over two years. We're down in Idaho approximately 20 percent in the last three years, and I'm sure most of you can share similar stories of significantly a disinvestment in higher education in recent years. In a recent study just a couple months ago by Inside Higher Education, presidents at public and private institutions across the United States said that key issues they face are the need for targeted budget cuts, including looking at eliminating or combining academic programs, hiring freezes, the need to increase tuition with the implications for access and inclusion, and the effort for more creative ways to deliver curricula at reduced costs. Simultaneously at the federal level, I was just in Washington a few weeks ago, they face additional issues that we're all aware of, including increasing regulations of higher education entities, new requirements for accreditation, significant cuts in the Pell Grant program, which influences access to higher education, termination of earmarks and reduction in funding from competitive grant programs such as the National Science Foundation. There's also the complex transition in the U.S. and global economy that relate to new knowledge-based jobs requiring some post-secondary education. In Idaho, in the next five years, two-thirds of the new jobs will require some level of post-secondary education. There's a growth in multinational companies, 
economic dynamism in the context of fast-growing entrepreneurial companies worldwide. There's a rapid growth in the digital economy in the context of e-commerce, and I'm sure we all practice that every day. It's no wonder, I think it's Barnes & Noble that's struggling right now, and many other uh, physically located. I heard about clothing uh, stores on NPR here just the other day where people go in and try on clothing in these stores, and then they go online and buy the, the clothing product. The dynamics are changing dramatically. And the growth in innovation capacity in the context of global leveraged capital, it's not just the amount of capital that one has, but how we leverage that. At the same time, last year's National Academy of Science report said that in recent, a recent ranking of IT, and in, of, of IT and the Innovation Foundation, that the U.S. was sixth in global innovation-based competitiveness but 40th when you look at the rate of change in the last decade. In the context of higher education, a recent article in Educause suggests we will likely face more pressure to relook at topics like the delivery of general education that will have different faculty faces of the future with more implications of IT and more global faculty and student mobility with more non-traditional students and more pressure to demonstrate the value of higher education at every level in US as the US transitions towards higher education as a private good versus a public good. While at the same time, we build more lifelong partnerships with our alumni and business partners across uh, our regions and nationally. I believe during this time of tremendous change in higher education, geography must continue to be on guard, but also it has many opportunities for our discipline as we move forward. Many of us remember the days when geography was threatened, and we must continue to position ourselves in positive ways on our campuses where many geography faculties are among the smallest on those campuses. And we must position ourselves in states, regions, and nationally as far as our value. And we have the opportunity to do that. So in the context of this environment and change, what are the opportunities for geography as we strategically position the discipline for the future? I feel these opportunities revolve around six themes. Our need to be more entrepreneurial, our need to demonstrate leadership and engagement, our need to continue to provide leadership and sustainability initiatives, our need to lead in education about global connections, our ability to lead in interdisciplinary work, and the need to provide perspectives of increasing diversity. In the context of these six themes, I believe a number of strategic direc directions are articulated very effectively in the 2010 National Academy of Science National Research Council report, Understanding the Changing Planet, Strategic Direction for Geographical Sciences. First of all, being more entrepreneurial. And by entrepreneurial, I mean being more innovative and creative and where we have joint venture opportunities to take advantage of partnerships, whether they're at the regional, national, international, or with businesses. In the broader context, this is a time of tremendous and rapid spatial reorganization of the economy and society, and geography is best positioned to offer insights to help understand how such issues as the impact of economic globalization affects local regions, or how geopolitical shifts influence stability. At the campus and regional level, we have opportunities, for example, to generate more resources, to show our, val show our value by demonstrative uh, creative approaches and workshops to businesses, to educators, to community leaders, or political leaders that might that might need to understand more fully the global geospatial reorganization in the context of their unique interests. We also have opportunities to be more entrepreneurial through applications of our geospatial technologies in all of its forms, and they're evolving rapidly. GIS to address issues in communities, states and nations is one of those. These approaches help us understand the global limitations of things like natural resources and numerous other topical areas. We need to engage business leaders for, to be advocates, recognizing the value of geography where they occur and engage them in support of our, our, of our discipline. In the context of engagement, it's time for geography to be fully engaged across our campus, communities, and states. But we also need to reclaim our roots in creative field courses and training for our students. 
Many universities are expanding their efforts in service learning, for example. Our university, I've put an important emphasis on that, and we won one of the uh, National Engagement Awards this past year. Reaching out to communities to address issues like water management and community planning. Geographers are well positioned to provide leadership with such efforts. A recent Time article, in fact the latest issue, has an article, Finishing Schools, which summarized the tremendous strides made in Finland when field experiences were integrated into the tra traditional classroom learning. Geographers are well positioned for leadership in this area, and we need to be creative about that. Geographers can also provide more engaged learning mod models using innovative geospatial technology approaches that can differentiate us as on the leading edge on our campuses relative to en enhanced learner outcomes. As the National Academy of Science National Research Council report suggests, through use of geospatial technologies and geostatistics, we can engage our campuses, our states, and beyond through better approaches to observing and analyzing our changing world. We also need to lead understanding of societal implications of citizen mapping and mapping citizens, all within the context of geography being more engaged. Sustainability is another important area where we ought to own that uh, across our campuses, across our regions, our states, and nationally. It's one in which geographers must be seen as leaders in the development of curricula around sustainability, as well as leading university-wide efforts in sustainability research and practice. The National Academy of Science report theme of environmental change reminds us of the context of a key geography question focused on how we respond to physical change. We preserve biodiversity and understand points of vulnerability in the human environmental system. Each is linked directly to the sustainability theme. In global connections, it's another theme that needs no explanation relative to the need for geographers. But scaling issues of community to region to nation and the world are so important and still not one, well understood by many across the United States. And geographers must lead this effort. We need to work aggressively with political forces to position us uh, as to why we're so important relative to the quality of life that we live here in the United States as well as economic development. Another key theme is the need for more cross-disciplinary research and geographers have a strong tradition in this area and we need to be leaders on our campuses uh, nationally and internationally in this area and many of us are doing that. But we need to be visible leaders as well as partners. For example, at the University of Idaho we have geographers who are recognized as campus leaders in the area of climatic change research and its implications for our, for our natural resource base in our region. We've already proven that integration of new ideas and diverse approaches strengthens our discipline rather than diminishes it. We have also helped include the importance of human factors and decision making in climate change and local environmental decision making in the broader context of environmental change. At the University of Idaho, We've employed a toolkit concept to bring people from across our campus together for a more robust look at research questions and trying to find the common ground rather than the differences across disciplines. And geographers in many ways are leading this effort versus the alternative of leaving us in smaller islands of inquiry. Finally, we must position our discipline to help with the tremendous changes that are occurring in our country and world in population structure and transitions. How is economic globalization affecting inequality, for example? And what is the demographic transition in the US doing to influence current and future geopolitics? Overall, this is a time of tremendous opportunities for geographers, but we, we must continue with a sense of urgency to be visible from the individual to the department to the professional society level to ensure our continued success in a rapidly changing higher education environments. Departments must have a vision of where they fit within their university, within their state, within our nation, and provide leadership in these critical areas. Certainly there are those that get demoralized. I get demoralized at times as I wake up thinking about our budget implications. But at the same time, we, can, we need to continue to promote our discipline across our campuses and beyond, to be student-centered, to be willing to think differently at the way we do business, to be collegial with a can-do attitude. 
I believe our discipline is positioned to control our own destiny while offering key solutions in creative ways to many of the world's most pressing challenges. We have what it takes to address many of the challenges that lie ahead. What we must do now is commit ourselves to step forward and lead. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. Marisi Nerad, our next speaker, is the founding director of the National Center for Innovation and Research in Graduate Education, known as CERG, and also Associate Dean of the Graduate School, <clears throat> where she served from 2003 to 2009, and also Associate Professor of Higher Education <clears throat> in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies in the College of Education at the University of Washington here in Seattle. CERG is the first such center for studies on graduate education in the United States. And it's really one of the first to study systematically the career paths of PhD recipients and the assessment of quality of doctoral education uh, based on asking PhD alumni about their experiences. And I'm very, we're very fortunate because geography was included in a number of these studies. She directs a variety of national and international research and evaluation efforts to understand forces that promote and impede improvement and change in doctoral education. She's widely recognized internationally and has been an invited speaker at many national and international conferences on graduate education. Her most recent co-edited co book from 2008 is Toward a Global PhD, Forces and Forms in Doctoral Education Worldwide. Dr. Nerad received her doctorate in higher education from the University of California, Berkeley. So let me turn things over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here as a non-geographer, <laughs> but who in the evaluation of NSF-funded IGATS always love to work with geographers. And I must say I'm so delighted that one of a former IGAT student graduate from the University of Washington is now a professor and is here in the audience. So, I will present today a specific picture of the world of change and the worlds of change in higher education. And that is, you can gather from my center, focus on doctoral education. And in fact, doctoral education worldwide. So while I will illustrate that more is asked these days from the next generation of researchers from our doctoral student. And I explain in the context of globalization why this is the case. I therefore will argue that we actually need to broaden our conceptual approach to graduate education and think differently than in the past. And I will highlight some tension, and then I will end with what I think are great opportunities, and my speaker before has filled them out very much with geographic specifics, but as an outsider, I can really see you, who always have dealt with the world outside, and who have not seen that there are national boundaries who can limit climate, Sometimes they do limit transportations, but so on. You are really in a wonderful situation to work together to educate our graduate students to become world citizens right here on our campuses and also send our graduate students across national and cultural boundaries so they accept differences and embrace diversity as a strive to solve societal problems. I want to preface also much of my thinking has been inspired by three international workshops which were all funded by NSF and which Search the Center developed and organized. And there were also around the world, one started here in Seattle, one at the University of Melbourne in Australia, one in Germany at the University of Kassel, 
and just recently a workshop in NSF itself on setting a research agenda, how we assess the international collaboration in graduate education. And that will be actually how I will end my talk today. So, that a verse since you may know, we can put about the 1990s that globalization has become a central phenomenon and a theme for all of society as well as doctoral education. And I want to make you aware, and I know you know that, but globalization takes place in the context where doctoral education and research capacity are very unevenly distributed around the world, even in our own country, and where a number of research universities, mainly in resource wealthy countries, have become powerful social institutions. And it's always easy to look elsewhere like Singapore, Qatar, and so on. But we know also what I'm talking about. Here I will distinguish, because lately in the literature I realize that often globalization and internationalization has been uh, regarded as one. Globalization is the effects beyond the control of one individual or even sets of actors. But internationalization is the strategy with societies or here higher education institutions really have for all the activities to prepare individuals to engage in a globalized world. So for universities and as it means that the process of integrating international, intercultural and global dimension into purpose, function and delivery of higher education. Now, what I'm arguing that and what I found actually empirically through research and through these workshops, that globalization has brought a number of common trends to graduate education worldwide. So we may speak of converging practices, but it also has very different effects on different regions and the more diverse graduate student body worldwide. So it's not just standardization, everything is homogeneous, but it has both effects. And I think you as geographer, you know that more than well. So due to globalization, today, higher education and graduate education has actually dual mission. It builds the nation infrastructure by preparing the next generation of professionals and researchers for the local and the national economy, inside and outside the academia, and is also confronted with the necessity to educate domestic and international students for a global economy and an international scholarly community. And international students are not only in the US, actually there are now more and more in other countries, particularly Europe is heavily recruiting. Australia has been and New Zealand heavily recruiting, but now within for example, Africa, South Africa realizes how important it is to build networks of having international students within South Africa, not to speak of Asian countries who have built all hubs. On Monday, there was in the International Herald Tribune an article about dual degrees, where it showed that they are increasing tremendously worldwide except in the US. Also, a recent study by the Royal Academy, the UK Royal Academy, which came out the end of last month, called Knowledge, Networks and Nations, which mainly looks at international collaboration in terms of publications were done with people from other countries and patterns so I think it's kind of narrow focus, only what you can quantify. But it actually shows while still the world wants to collaborate and publish with US people, in terms of the increase and expansion, 
the US is rather getting smaller and, and unfortunately becoming more inward looking. My students ask me, why is that? And I'm saying, well, yes, we have the best, we had the best <laughs> facilities. We had a very good reputation and still we can say the largest number of international graduate students are coming to the US. Yes, but we have to look outside and have to see how the number of international students is increasing tremendously, particularly Europe, who has made enormous effort. So now in the history of universities, we have come full circle from the university being the medieval, in the medieval age, centers of learning, functioning also in a common language, you may guess it was Latin, not English, and serving an international clientele, then moved in the 19th and 20th century, very much becoming a national entity, and in certain states becoming particularly a national, nationalistic focus, pursuing national interest. And now, once again, universities are emerging as international centers of learning and scholarship, in addition to serving particular regional interest. So let me explain. Um, and I say, you know, when we talk about globalization, well, you know, we may hate it, we may love it, you know, it's never one or the other, and we know it has many side effects, but we have to accept it, it's there, and I think we can best universities be proactive and move forward. So let me explain, in this context of change in higher education, why specific doctoral education has become the focus in so many countries. Economic theories of the knowledge economy has been embraced by governments worldwide. The theories argue that knowledge is crucial to economic growth and increased prosperity. Theories of the knowledge economy locate the cause of economic growth in novel ideas leading to scientific, technical, organizational, environmental, and health innovation. So now, innovations and technical change are seen as a principal means of economic growth and sustaining international competition. As this knowledge economy has spread around the world, national governments in many places have turned to master's doctoral and postdoctoral education as a way of educating scientific and technical innovators because who has new ideas in dissertation? You should have new ideas, right? So doctoral education has really become a global endeavor, and not only nations, but supranational organizations as OECD, the European Union, the UNESCO, the World Bank, even the World Bank are now developing policies for enhancing their contribution to doctoral education, to national and regional economic growth. So within this context, governments, and I must say except the US, has very much allocated substantial increased funds into doctoral education. And you know that the Europeans specifically had till 2010 3% of the gross national product in all the countries that nearly made it, not in all, we know Greece and Ireland and so on. But so what is happening is that now uh, research and development and doctoral education in many countries has become part of the R&D budget and part of the innovation policies. So not only the supply of highly skilled people but also how widely academic knowledge is disseminated has an influence on economic and social development in the nations. Or put differently, new knowledge must be effectively disseminated and absorbed if innovation and economic growth are to proceed from it. So under such concepts, you can imagine, doctoral education has to be rethought. Now, let me tell you um, the changes 
this one, right? In fact, one is what I already hinted to worldwide, an enormous increase in the PhD production. In all the countries, we see more women, more international student, and more part-time and older students getting a doctorate. Actually, it's something which universities around the world are not very much uh, focusing on. We have really a very diverse adult learning population and often they're not really treated as adult, who are not empty vessels to be filled in, but bring their experience with them. Second, given the innovation policy, increasingly education and research training is organized in a problem-solving approach, using multidisciplinary teams and including participation from various sectors of society. This brings into doctoral education a form of knowledge which has been known mostly outside the US, in, even in Canada, Europe, and around the world as a mode two, as compared to mode one. In mode two means, in mode one means learning from one masters in one discipline, and mode two would be in application, operating around application in transdisciplinary mode, with several actors like university, industry, business, governments. So you can think of the many triangle and research clusters, so on. So knowledge is becoming socially accountable and the emphasis is actually on translational research. That means that research not only stops at basic research findings, but translates basic findings into application that respond to societal and business needs. So consequently, our PhDs not only need to know how to do research, but be competent writers, speakers, managers, team members who can communicate research goals and results effectively inside and outside the universities. These skills have been called in various parts of the world. Here we call them professional skills. In other countries, they are called soft skills. In worldwide, we see also an increase in standardization in doctoral education. Now, this really can be seen negative. The positive part is also we have greater mobility because there's more compatibility. We see another effect that is by funding coming from governments and private sources, accountability is very high. It practically also translates that our doctoral students who then become research and will have grants need to also learn how good managing skills and including managing people and budgets. And that had been something we found geographers were not very great. Fifth, uh, uh, six, another effect which also was talked by, my, by the speaker before is we are in a global community and with global networks and our doctoral students and graduate students need to know also a lot of the IT skills. Higher education is responding to market forces faster than before and it becoming very competitive pressure on the entire research enterprise. There is an enormous competition for PhD students. They are free to go wherever they get the best education and the most financial support. It's not anymore restricted to one country. And lastly, the quality assurance mechanisms are essential. Many countries have started the quality assurance agency, but what I would say, and where you as geographers are most important you can contribute is, how do we assess international collaboration? How do we assess really the benefit for the individual, the institutional, and the national 
level and for the knowledge production itself. So these, as I mentioned earlier, because of all these trends, more is asked from the next generation. They have to know, in addition to the academic research skills, critical thinking, research design, and so on, working in multidisciplinary team, knowing about research ethics and applying them. We talk about con con responsible conduct and research. They also have to have professional competencies. I named these before, you can read them here. But in addition, now we need, and that's another push, the preparation needs to include intercultural competencies in order to be able to work collaboratively in international teams on solving societal problems in multinational settings. Now, how do we turn and, and educate our next generation and give them all those skills? That's why I'm thinking we need to rethink our concepts. Our, here I was just showing that indeed geographers um, did not get all this high training. You have the blue one, we asked them what skills are important in your current job. And the orange column is how high was the quality of your training you received in there. So you can decide for yourself whether it's good or not. Now, traditionally, we have um, the concept, how we conceptualize doctoral education. The model we have is the apprenticeship model. That means a one-on-one -on -one tutorship approach where the masters, the professor passes on to the student his or her knowledge. Now, this is a very narrow one and actually quite outdated because the masters are often not around. Here in the US, they're in Washington DC, trying to get more research money and so on. Besides, can a master have all these competencies? You know, it said we may be not the best in all the IT skills and so on. Another concept which is important is indeed is professional socialization. This is where disciplinary norms and values pass down. But one criticizes also that, and I did earlier, it is like our doctoral students are open vessels and we just pour in, but in fact, it's quite static and this is not so. We need to widen our perspective and think of doctoral education of a community of practice where many people are involved and that means our doctoral students are first on the periphery and become young learners and move more and more in the center and becoming more and more responsibilities in their everyday activities in doing research. This means also we need to value and explain to them and make transparent that's not only the one professor, the one mentor, if he or she just would do everything, everything would be fine. That's not the case, that's just impossible. We know that. But see other faculty, their advanced peers, the doctoral student is very, very important com uh, components in their training, going to conference even if they're on campuses. So in all, I'm saying we need to broaden our concept and think also internationally that Doctoral education is really as a global village, borrowing from the Nigerian proverb, that many levels of the university and outside need to be included in it. What are the tensions? So how do we foster socially relevant research and create enough room for basic research? Do our structures allow for intellectual risk taking? And I'm thinking specifically of the funding structures. If they're funded as research assistant on our grant, they must be successful, they must be done in a certain time. Also as greater dean, we want to have them done in a certain time. But how can you really have innovative and novel ideas that cannot always come on demand and in a certain time? So how do we balance this? Are our internationalization activities a two-way approach? 
Too often I heard actually recently just from my South African colleagues saying, we have many universities knocking at our door from Western countries, but sometimes we wonder, is it our exotic minerals? Is it our exotic plants and climates? Or our exotic people? Or is it really us? That's what I mean about a two-way approach. And are our activities mitigating unequal distribution of intellectual capital and the negative consequences of brain drain? And therefore, I think, as from policy recommendation from one of our last conference, specifically, geography could undertake capacity building project that can employ doctor level researchers in the developing world. These here are a number of very concrete possibilities um, which our group of international experts in doctoral education found are lacking all over the world. We actually need to train our own faculty to, effect to effectively facilitate cross-cultural research groups. We need to integrate our international students from the very beginning in the program and not have the lens that they are is kind of deficient, they need to adapt. But the other way around, that our own doctoral students, that we can actually learn from them and we have a two-way communication. And we need to also allow them, and I think in your field that's easily the case, that they do research also on their countries and help our own students who we sent abroad and them to re-enter when they return. And that's something which is rarely done. So I end in saying, is it too much to expect that graduate education contribute to providing a global environment for a vivid international knowledge-based development from which most countries, and I would love to say all countries can benefit. I think geography, given its content and past, can play a key part in this development. In addition to serving as vice provost for research and graduate and as graduate dean, Dr. Taylor served in several posts at Howard University, including executive assistant to the president, interim vice president for academic affairs, dean of his home school of communications, and chair of the Department of Communication Arts and Sciences. Additionally, Dr. Taylor has served as president of the Consortium of Social Science Associations, COSA, as we know it, the National Communication Association, and the Northeastern Association of Graduate Schools. He's a former member of the advisory committee of the Directorate for Education and Human Resources of the National Science Foundation, and has served on, is an, on the advisory council of the National Institute of Institutes of Health. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Taylor. Thank you, President Foote. I'm tempted to simply say ditto and sit down. <laughs> because uh, one of the great advantages of going last is that all of the previous speakers make all the key points. And so I, I like most such persons, I'm in a position of uh, saying amen, ditto, <laughs> and let's have some conversation with the audience. I'm going to, in the interest of time and being respectful of the time and wanting to have some opportunity for the audience to interact with us to go rather speedily uh, through my presentation here tonight. But I want to begin by saying while we are focusing a great deal on the current environment and change and things of this nature. The fact of the matter is, is that colleges and universities are in a constant state of change, depending upon the era, the particular point in time. We have new students and new faculties. We have new sites where our facilities are located. We have new collaborations. We have changing marketplaces. And we have many aspects of change that we've seen historically in our society that, have, that we can identify that have brought on great changes in our institutions of higher learning. For example, following World War II, we saw the, not only a great increase of research, but the creation of the National Science Foundation, 
During the civil rights era of the 1960s and early 70s, we saw a great emphasis on diversity and access, at least greater than it is at, at, previ at previous times. We had a greater emphasis on technology with the rise of the internet, and now currently we talk a great deal about the global aspect of higher education as the world has become flatter. And most of these conversations uh, around the, uh, the changing nature of society locally, uh, nationally, and globally, we focus a great deal on the such topics as the economy. You've heard that mentioned already tonight. American competitiveness, uh, technology, globalization, changing demographics, and so on. And these are just a few of the topics that have, uh, we have, in fact, seen a great discussion. I want to just comment on just a few topics that we can really see that really have influenced our whole conversation on institutional change and the potential impact for, for geography. We have interdisciplinarity. We have diversity of gender, race, ethnicity, and age, business priorities and entrepreneurship, evolving delivery systems, uh, globalization, as you've just heard from, my previous, from the previous speaker, institutional linkages, niche institutions, uh, and some topics around beyond lecturing and the like. But I want to just give you some context for each of these without going through a lot of slides here. I want to start by sharing with you a comment made by Gordon Gee, president of Ohio State University, though some of the institutional, that's the Ohio State University, I might add. He said that we need to reinvent ourselves. The American university is not broken, but it is certainly not reaching its potential in the 21st century. Our universities are organized vertically. They should be organized horizontally around programs, working groups, centers, institutes, and ideas. And that speaks a bit to the comment made earlier by President Nellis. And one of the reasons why interdisciplinarity is so critical for our conversation is that information is, is larger than ever. There's more of it. As some argue that it's doubling every two to three years. And in fact, big questions and big issues uh, facing society at large cannot be answered or addressed within single disciplines. And one great joy, and indeed a great honor, for me to be here with a group of geographers is that this discipline has understood that. In fact, it has uh, probably led to the revival of the field in many cases, where there was a time when you saw uh, a pattern of closure of the geography departments and, and declining interest in the field. But as you can look by your own numbers in terms of the growth of your national meeting, uh, uh, Dr. Richardson mentioned uh, the size of the program the last time you were in, in, in Seattle. There's been a great explosion of interest in geography, and much of it, and I would argue, has been associated with the fact that geographers have connected with many topics, whether it's health or psychology, my own area where I'm working today, uh, geography and climate change, uh, President Nellis mentioned that, geography and, and GI science, uh, urban studies, and so on. So the issue of interdisciplinarity is obvious, and I would applaud the members of this uh, discipline for having uh, been a leader, in fact, in advancing interdisciplinary thought in our institutions of higher learning. I want to move now quickly to the topic of diversity. The United States, and we've heard this many times before, cannot compete without more diversity of race, ethnicity, and gender. And one might even ask, can geography as a discipline compete without more diversity in these areas? For example, African Americans and Hispanics are 30% of the United States population. Women are 60% of college students today. And if you look, however, at the, at the numbers, both groups continue to be underrepresented in geography. Last statistics, 2009, 209 geography degrees awarded in the United States, two to African Americans, 1% of the total. Hispanics representing somewhere on the order of, of somewhere on the order of um, 17 to 18 percent of the population, 11 Hispanic geographers produced of that 209. So these two groups together, 
blacks and Hispanics, comprising 30 percent of the American population, produce 6 percent of the 209 geographers in 209. Women have made great strides in geography, but yet the fact of the matter is, while women constitute uh, 60 percent of American college students and are now acquiring more PhD degrees than men in the United States, 37 percent of geography PhDs are awarded to women. And so if you ask the question, and in fact that number is the second lowest in the social sciences. Thank, you know, almost say thank God for economics, which of course is the <laughs> fewest number of all. <laughs> but the question with the whole issue of how we make the discipline attractive to a wider range of students is an issue that we have to, I think, address if the field is going to be uh, competitive as we move forward. Why does diversity matter? It certainly matters in terms of competitiveness. It's good business because it attracts new students, and in fact, the fastest growing group of students in the United States are women and people of color. And so the impact on the business side of the field in terms of attracting students obviously is an important issue. And certainly the preparing all students to focus and to function in multicultural America and the global community will require us to have a diverse faculty, a faculty that uh, reflects the diversity of the country. And in fact, if you read the work of uh, Patricia Gurin of the University of Michigan, who did the major psychological work that led to the important uh, decision of the Supreme Court earlier in this century, it showed that white students actually acquire more knowledge, are more excited about their disciplines in direct relationship to their uh, ability to study in multicultural, multinational, international classrooms with faculty of diverse groups. And of course, we know that diversity enriches research, the research environment with respect to the questions that are asked, the methodologies for research that are posed, and the interpretations of data. With respect to business and entrepreneurship, I'm very happy that topic has come up already. We all know that there's a declining public and benefactor support in the, in, in the, uh, in the United States at the same time with rising costs. Uh, you heard about the numbers in, 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 in the state of Wa in Washington, which of course is startling. Uh, just recently left the state of California where approximately half billion dollars are expected to be cut from the higher education budgets during this fiscal year, not to mention future years. And so this situation, uh, the financial situation, not just from the public sector, but from the private sector as well, has forced all of us in higher education to become much more sensitive to matters of efficiency and accountability. And whether we like it or not, and President Nellis knows this far better than I, we all have to face questions about the viability of programs. And often in those environments, programs that we know are intellectually important get the ax. We've seen that happening from institution to institution around the country. My own institution, Howard University, uh, closed this geography program many years ago and just cut a, several others recently, and often related to the, uh, the ratio of revenue to cost. So we cannot be uh, unmindful of these financial challenges. And so therefore, topics such as branding and marketing are big deals, and not just from proprietary institutions. Uh, I, I looked at the, at the internet screen in the hotel just this afternoon and up pops Rutgers University, one of the oldest and most distinguished public institutions in the country, advertising in front of me as I'm going onto the internet at the Sheraton Hotel. And so topics such as diversity, engagement, and interdisciplinarity turn out to not just be good ideas and not just intellectually interesting, but they are important on the business side, because as institutions have more interdisciplinarity, have more diversity, pay more attention to branding and marketing, they make themselves more attractive to students. In short, the rise of the entrepreneurial university, institutions that attempt to transform innovations for the economic good on the one hand, but also for the public good are the institutions that are becoming increasingly attractive. And I'll make a comment in just a moment before I sit down about the, the, the experience at Arizona State University under the leadership of Michael Crow, a former provost at Columbia, who describes the new American university. And six of the eight pillars of Arizona State focus around these issues of interdisciplinarity, 
around public good and the like. And in the context of that, it demonstrates that it does not mean you're compromising quality or compromising growth where over 23,000 new students are at the university, three Nobel laureates and the like. Another theme that I think that will challenge us in the future in this current environment is that we have to identify new models for delivering our academic programs. The nine to five, Monday through Friday, talk and chalk, lecture only model is passe. To attract more students, revenue, institutions must increase online, weekend, evening, and blended offerings of courses. Delivery models must meet the needs of an expanded pool of students, including working adults. New pedagogies need to be developed, and in fact, our faculty, not just the new faculty, but the more senior faculty must also acquire, become much more sensitive and, and, and more adept in using newer approaches to learning. In fact, the paradigm shifting from teaching to learning uh, as we have this changing environment of students. We've heard a great discussion about the globalization issue. I will not talk about them in any more detail except to say we're now in an environment where we, we talk about benchmarking programs. I know we, we all pretend we don't pay attention to U.S. News and World Report. And whenever the, uh, you get the doctoral uh, uh, reports that finally come out, I don't want to go up to the National Research Council's recent assessment of doctoral programs, but we, all, we, we claim that they're, they're not valid. We don't care about them except that we're number one or top ten. We put it on our websites, right? The question, has, but the point is, is that benchmarking is important. We make the case for students. We make that case in attracting faculty. We make that case to state legislators and to, and to foundations. But we benchmark mainly inside the United States. And so I think a very interesting and challenging opportunity for us, and particularly in organizations like yours, AAG, where I understand from the president earlier tonight that about 25% of the membership of AAG are from outside the United States. So the whole question of benchmarking being the number one geography or the number 10 or the top 20 or whatever, the number, whatever way you want to play the game, the benchmark should be a global model. And in fact, we need to think about reordering our thinking about what is a, quote, competitive program, not just from U.S. U.S.-centric models, if you will, but from global models. And in fact, there are implications for the names of our national societies, which often have the word of national or American in them. Perhaps we need to think about having a more nomenclature that reflects our international character. With regard to international programs and joint degrees, I'm so glad Clarice mentioned about the U.S. being behind the curve of advancing joint degrees. We're also behind the curve in developing what often are called sandwich programs, where a person might acquire, might begin their doctoral studies in another country, go to a, uh, to a host country to do the, say, the second or third year of a doctoral study, then return to the initial country to complete their work, perhaps with a dissertation committee made up of individuals from both countries. Very commonly done. Very commonly done in many parts of the world. As it turns out, just this past week, I personally have had conversations with colleagues in Europe and in the continent of Africa about such arrangements. And I do know that there are funding opportunities in the government which would encourage this sort of arrangement. But I think as we think about globalization, we really do, and it ought to be bi-directional so that it is U.S. universities offering the same opportunities. So we're now working on a program whereby students in international psychology will do a part of their work in a country like Rwanda, for instance, where there are significant mental health issues associated with the recent genocide situation, it will enhance the education of U.S. students to do a sandwich-like arrangement for part of their work on the continent of Africa in that particular country. Two or three more minutes, I will stop because I do want us to have some conversation. The issue of engagement and the public good is critical. We talk a lot about the entrepreneurial university as if it only benefits the economic good. But in fact, the engaged university 
and entrepreneurship go hand in hand. And if you, as I think of the entrepreneurial university, I think of an institution that is using its knowledge and its innovations to transform society in such a way that it benefits both the economic good and the public good. And we hear a lot of discussion around the engaged institution and about engaged, the engaged uh, uh, department or the engaged discipline. The public, the public government's benefactors want graduates who will use their education to serve the public good and so do students. And it's good for business. In fact, Students are looking and are attracted to programs that allow them an opportunity to acquire an education which will enhance their ability to uh, meet the needs of the general public. Very quickly, my laundry list of reforms. More professionally oriented programs which prepare students for careers beyond academia, beyond careers in research universities, Remember, over half of our students today in American higher education are in community colleges, not research university. And what about more applied opportunities for students? History is in it in areas such as public history. What about programs in, for example, applied geography? Just to use one example, that's one kind of reform. Another student-centered programs and programs sensitive to the needs of older students with careers and families consideration of needs of non-traditional students seeking career advancement, and the point about uh, programs that are sensitive to rate, completion rates and times of grade have already been mentioned, uh, consideration of models and traditional special focus and even proprietary institutions such as University of Maryland, University College, to give you one example of the Chicago School where I am now, just to mention a couple, mention those two. Another reform would be more market and workforce driven approaches to higher education, more attention to adult learning models, greater commitment to applied qualitative and cross disciplinary research, and then most importantly, I believe, preparation of a new generation of faculty capable of teaching the new student in the new American university, in the words of Crow, and committed to engagement in entrepreneurship. I'll conclude by mentioning, uh, and for future reference, two, two um, very interesting programs. Well, the, the Intellectual Entrepreneurship Program at the University of Texas. I urge you to go to their website. It's a very interesting program that's been very successful. Richard Cherwitz is its director. I invite you to see John Frazier here in the audience to take a look at what they've done at SUNY Binghamton in terms of their work in race, ethnicity, and place which has been highly successful and become extremely attractive to students of color, has been very, very successful in, in, in raising those numbers that I talked about before in terms of diversity. I invite you to look at Holden Thorpe's uh, recent book. He's the president of the University of North Carolina called Engines of Innovation, the Entrepreneurial University in the 21st Century. And then finally, uh, the, the pillars, the eight pillars of Arizona State University. Uh, articulated so eloquently by its president, Michael Crow. Uh, in, in this mission statement, it says the university promotes excellence in research, increases access, and works with communities for social and economic development. And the eight pillars of Arizona State, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a booster for Arizona State, but it's an example of a research university that gets it with respect to the kinds of conversations we're having here tonight. Six of the eight pillars, I'll read them very quickly. Transform societies, number one, which is to catalyze social change by being connected to social needs. Two, value entrepreneurship, use knowledge and encourage innovation. Three, conduct youth-inspired research, that is research with purpose and discipline and, and importance. Fuse intellectual disciplines, interdisciplinarity, that is, create knowledge by transcending disciplines. Five, be socially embedded. Connect with the communities through mutually beneficial partnerships. And six, engage globally. Engage with people and issues locally, nationally, and globally. Thank you very much.
have time. We have time for just a few questions before the reception opens up uh, next door, and um, some questions have come forward. We have one for each of the um, each of the speakers, and then one that all of them might be able to address. For Dr. Nellis, much of the discussion has been about how to survive the changes higher ed is undergoing. But rhetoric aside, these changes aren't a storm, natural and inevitable. They're social shifts. What is driving those changes and what can be done to counter or shape them? This is from Dylan Brady, University of Oregon. There are, there are clearly uh, social shifts that are occurring and we're all aware of those things. Uh, and, um, and many of those forces are in, in some ways, I would argue, um, counter to uh, what we value here in the United States, and I'll show my biases here, to what is best for um, the university environment uh, as we move forward. Uh, there's almost a, a in some ways, anti-intellectualism, uh, uh, the, the conservative movement, I think, is, is uh, in many ways, uh, uh, this is the first stage. You know, there's been the attack at the K-12 level, but uh, many would argue that the next stage is the, uh, the attack on universities. I mean, we felt it already, but this is not the end. And uh, so, uh, in some ways, my use of the word storm is, is just to try to get our attention that this is happening. And uh, it's not an easy task. I think part of what I've been able to do in a very conservative state of Idaho is, uh, again, uh, some of this has come out in our discussion here tonight, is talk about, again, I th they, there seems to resonate the message of the impact of our university every day on the, the competitiveness of Idaho in the region and globally from an economic perspective and as far as preserving our quality of life. And, uh, and again, I keep banging on how important we are as far as the economic competitiveness and the jobs. You know, Georgetown University did an analysis of the future jobs in the next five to ten years and many of those are going to require some post-secondary level of education. And, and so how do we position ourselves as a state, as a region, a nation in that context? So we, we have to be at a heightened level, and not just as geographers, but as academics, uh, to recognize uh, that there's a lot of countermeasures that are really not supportive of what we all believe in. And I think the more we can adapt and recognize, you know, Michael Crow resonates with a lot of people. Uh, and you can look at his model, and uh, it's been successful, but it's fairly dramatic. I mean, faculty are teaching a lot, many faculty are teaching a lot more students, uh, more heavier teaching loads. Um, there's a differentiation of faculty across the campus. Um, some of his own faculty are, 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 uh, uh, are not that supportive, but many others are. So it's a fairly dramatic model, but it's resonating. I was just at an American Council on Education meeting in Washington a few weeks ago, and one of the, really interesting to me, it's in my state, one of the, uh, the featured speaker for all these presidents and chancellors from universities, public and private, was BYU-Idaho. It's in Rexburg, Idaho. The president of BYU-Idaho is a former dean of the Harvard, Law, uh, Harvard Business School. And it was very much this model of it's a 12-month schedule. Faculty are teaching five courses per semester. They teach, uh, they have a very accelerated uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, and that, that was being held up as a, as a model. So there are a lot of these counter forces that we just need to be, you know, we all recognize the value of research universities and the value that that adds to the learner outcome as well to our students and those experiences. So uh, there, there's a lot of kind of counter societal changes that I think we all need to be prepared for. We're seeing it right now, every day in Washington, D.C. And, um, and, uh, but there's opportunity too if we position ourselves well. I think uh, 
the more we can talk about jobs and the, the applied aspects of what we do, the value of that, not to, not to divorce ourselves from the basic research that's so important, but the more we can clearly articulate the value added, I think that's going to be so important as we move forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Here's a question from Marisi. I fully agree with the speaker's advocacy of interdisciplinarity and intercultural collaboration for PhD training. However, from my personal and other college, colleagues' experiences, PhD students are still located in one particular department or discipline, and it's still encouraged to keep a certain way of doing research in order to avoid future risk in achieving the PhD. That is, what's, what's the advice for uh, keeping this disciplinary territory and keeping this attitude for uh, basically safety? So, my argument is, and it's part what I said why I talk about the global village, that doctoral education needs to go outside the department. In fact, a number of universities, and I'm thinking of um, my former university, Berkeley, it took 10 years, but they broke down departmental boundaries in all of the biological science. There is no department anymore, but there are affinity groups, and realize that the research and the application of research is moving so fast disciplinary and with the departmental boundaries are really holding up uh, forward movement and new challenges. So I think if we are in doctor program and keep our students only there, we don't do a good service to them. And I think we have on each campus excellent examples in the NSF funded interdisciplinary research and education traineeship, the so-called IGATS, which get about 2.5 million from NSF to the program, and it must be interdisciplinarity, so interdisciplinary programs with professional development and bringing people from the outside in. I can only say of having done a number of evaluation of these, these really have a ripple effect on campuses and students coming out differently. So what we can do when in a department push our students, go, go also to your graduate school, they have other, go for example to a humanities centers our humanity center just started a big collaboration with the new center for the future of the biology. We really need to go across disciplines and it cannot be always in a program, but then the campus is there for everybody. Thank you, Thank you very much. And one question here for Dr. Taylor. And given the growing casualization of academic labor and cuts in higher education budget, is it not irresponsible to continue to enroll PhD students for whom there are very few academic positions? And doesn't this disproportionately affect women, minorities, and non-traditional students? I, I think that speaks to the need to prepare students for diverse career paths. Mm -hmm. So if we have a discipline that is only preparing people for jobs in academia, and particularly for research university jobs, I believe it is a disservice because the number of positions are indeed limited. And that's one thing why the, the proprietary for profit institutions have been extremely successful. They've been very job oriented. And in fact, someone mentioned a moment ago, I think probably at the ACA meeting, there is this increasing expectation by regulators and accreditors including the U.S. Department of Education to, uh, to require institutions to document the fact that students can get a job upon graduation. That, I think, is going to be a growing trend. So I think this, this external pressure for, uh, for jobs upon graduation could lead or should lead us to think about diversifying the career paths that students might take upon the completion of their graduate degrees. That's very important. The other topic is, and I think this reflects 
some of the work of the National Science Foundation with respect to professional science master's degree programs, that there are many jobs at the graduate level that people can assume that don't require a PhD and do not require a research degree. And so therefore, the development of more professionally oriented master's degrees, and I would dare say doctoral degree programs, would also uh, address that particular concern. Thank you very much. Let me pose one last question, and any of the panelists could, could answer it and uh, field this question. Um, how can we as higher education experts better educate members of Congress or governors across the country with this push to disinvest in education, but at the same time still try and achieve economic growth and development that's so tightly tied to higher education? It's a tough one, so anybody can feel that. Well, I would say what uh, the National uh, Research Council you mentioned in the report rising uh, uh, above the gathering storm, gathering <laughs> uh, the gathering it's, and it has reached point five, is indeed we need to be quite dramatic with the examples what's happening if we disinvest hmm. in higher education. And we need to point out, and that I think only politician listens when they see themselves from the outside that other countries are really leading in many ways the U.S. Is, may not anymore be the leading country. I think we need to point this out. That gets people going. I think uh, President uh, Nelson's point also is very important where, where we communicate, and this is a leadership issue, the, 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 the business or the economic should use that term, economic benefits to states uh, in investing in higher education. I recall many years ago having heard uh, former Governor Winter of Mississippi comment on what the impact of undereducation of the people of Mississippi had done, particularly the African Americans, today on the economy of the state because they could not attract certain industries to the state because it was not an educated workforce that was needed at the time. Great. A lot of things have happened in Mississippi since that time that's made the state much more competitive. But once legislators understand that it is in their self-interest to invest in education, I think that uh, we'll see a greater progress. Yeah, I totally, uh, totally agree with the comments here. And I think the more we can relate directly to where they see the economic uh, benefits, uh, the better off we are. We just had an economic impact study, and a lot of universities do this. Uh, what's the economic impact on the state? You know, our return is every dollar the state spends, we, we return $10 uh, from the university. And also the products, uh, just as an example, I, you may not be aware that Idaho produces about 80 to 85 percent of the restaurant trout in the United States. We do that research at the University of Idaho. Recently there was a new uh, a disease, cold water disease, that was affecting the trout industry. We developed a new vaccine for that. It's saving the trout industry nine to ten million dollars a year in Idaho. They can relate to that. They understand that, the need to invest. And that's just an example that I use. Uh, and it goes on and on. Uh, but, but many of us can do that. And, and they understand that, that direct economic uh, argument. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here.